today, Professor Ahn generously gave me an opportunity to share with you one of my kind of favorite topic, music entrepreneurship. And before my time here, coming to MSU, I was in New York in the School of Manhattan School of Music. And for the past five years, I was a teaching assistant in a program called Music Entrepreneurship, Center for the Music Entrepreneurship, which is a department to help students basically be able to make any project come true, okay? To make a career in music. Because for many, many years, and it's also true for myself when I was in undergrad, all I had to do was practice and win a competition. And I thought things would just magically happen. And to my surprise, even today, you know, if you go to many different conservatories, that's how students are thinking. But the truth is that that's not the reality for the most of us, 99% of ourselves. So they, they start to create this department to help a student um, really be able to make their dream come true in reality. And it had to do with a lot of learning about music business, okay? And there are many different parts to that. But the, really the starting point, okay, of musical foundation is going to be your professional material that's going to be send it out to the employee employers, right? So there are two documents, okay, that we must have, okay? In this room, everyone should have this. One is a bio, and the other one is resume. Now, I want to see, raise your hand if you already have your bio. Okay, what about resume? Okay, all right, so you already know how important resume is in terms of applying for uh, positions, okay? So we're going to dive deep into how to write it and what to be careful of, or, and also my personal tip, because I've worked with hundreds of students to revise their bio and resume, okay? And, but I wanna start with bio today, because it's such a ambiguous territory, right? How to write good bio. It's very difficult to define. But I'm sure you had uh, many experiences reading your friend's bio or other musician's bio. And did you have experience where you are reading it, but you're not really digesting any information or don't know what this musician is about, right? Because all you see is education, name of the competitions, name of the venues, and so what, right? So we want to move away from that tradition of a bio. So I'm going to share with you, that, okay? I'm going to ask um, Professor An to send you out all these documents so you don't have to take a note or anything. Just, you know, sit back and try to digest the information. But here's my six steps, okay? Six suggestions how to write bio. So obviously, you want to list all, the, your, all of your accomplishments, okay, best accomplishments, either, usually it's a performance, okay, performance-based, but it could be a number of other things. It could be a teaching, it could be some kind of award or scholarships too. List them, okay, on a piece of paper. That's a good place to start. And when you do that, yes, we need to include the name of the hall where you perform, on who you perform with, right? Any scholarships, festivals, teachers, okay? All that information is necessary. But probably the most important uh, part of a bio is personalization. Your personal information is so crucial because that's the moment I get to know you or we get to know about the artist, okay? The performer, a little bit closer. So this is really useful, your personal information. Usually, they talk about where they're from, okay, which is very good, right? If you're from Bozeman, Montana, and there's a concert in Bozeman, Montana, obviously, you feel like you know the person. Or let's say you went to a concert in New York City and suddenly found out that the artist is actually from Belgrade. And that makes you a special connection to yourself, right? Just, just because seeing that one particular information will change the perspective of artists, okay? So usually what we see in a bio, 
is that you're going to see this kind of information at the very bottom okay, of the bio. Sometimes they include their hobbies, what they like to do, or they talk about you know, their family structure, okay? things like two daughters right, or two dogs, two cats. Okay? Those things will be very useful. Once you listed all these information, then you have to decide which one comes first, right? And this is challenging, yeah? Now, I've seen so many bios usually start with, if you're a student, you tend to start that you actually study in this school, that you're a student, right? But when you are sending these bio to the professional venue, the professional environment, you want to change that perspective. Okay? You want to start practicing treating yourself as a professional at this point. Okay? I know it's so awkward. I know it. I've been through it, and I've seen many students doing that. But we need to practice that. And that goes same for the resume. Okay? But you have to treat yourself as a professional. Because, just think about it, for people who never study music, from their perspective, you are <laughs> really professional. And once you're on the stage, they think you are a star, right? So you want to think from that perspective, okay? I recommend this is a place where you can choose how you want to be understood by the reader, okay? This is the moment you could brand yourself, the first sentence. So let's say, let's say you are really into Baroque music, for example. Let's say you're a flutist and really, really into Baroque music. That's what you love to do, want to do. Tell us in the first sentence, right? You could say, you know, um, Baroque specialist, Baroque enthusiast, advocate of a Baroque music, or advancing the repertoire of Baroque style. Something like that. Yeah, something that tells us your best interest, okay? that would be really helpful. Now, if you have some kind of a quote, okay, from newspaper or musical magazine, that could be useful, right? Buchoso, New York Times. I've seen many of that, okay? They like to use it. It doesn't really mean much to us personally, but for the people who are not in the musical field, seeing something like that, will kind of give them what we call a hollow effect. Does anybody know what hollow effect is in psychology? What it is is if you hear just one amazing accomplishment about the person and you think the person is super amazing in all other way. So if I say I'm the winner of international competition, okay, without telling anything, you assume that I'm a great player. Right? But winning that comp, how many winners are there, right, in internationally? It doesn't mean actually much about the quality of my playing, but you assume that it's going to be great. That's a hollow effect, right? And we want to actually use that in bio and also in resume, okay? So find something that will really be the best quality or best accomplishment that you achieved, okay? You could say, the winning the scholarship, receiving scholarship, that's also good, right? That distinguish yourself from other students. So that's also very useful. Okay, so I want to think about that. Then we have to kind of go through it and find out what would be the logical way of delivering these information. And please avoid chronological order, meaning I was born in 2004, in Bozeman, Montana, I went to Bozeman Middle School, Bozeman High School, then I'm studying MSU right now. <laughs> so that's the chronological order. Nobody wants to know about the entire history of your life, right? That's not interesting. So I would avoid it, okay? I would mix it, okay? Chronological order is not recommended in bio. Write a draft, obviously, okay? And when you write a draft, Okay, obviously you're writing a bio about yourself, so it's going to be awkward because you have to refer yourself with Mr. 
Harney. <laughs> right, Mr. He's my student, so I'm he's using his name. Mr. Harney. Okay, saxophone virtuoso. Then in the next sentence, you shouldn't use Mr. Harney, right? You should use he. Yeah? Because if you keep repeating Mr. Harney, Mr. Harney, Mr. Harney, it's an awkward sentence. It's an awkward English. So you have to always mix it up. Never use I, <laughs> okay, in a professional bio. It always has to be the third person. Now, the rule of thumb is if you use he after that, next sentence, you have to reintroduce Mr. Herney, okay? I would recommend using Mr. or Miss. I would avoid using the first name because first name is too, too friendly, okay? It won't come across as a professional. So I would recommend use Mr. And miss. Once you write it, ask your friends, family, and teachers to proofread it, okay? At least three to four times. It will be really helpful. And you're going to see um, some awkward sentences, or, you know, your friends could give you a better idea about your strength, okay? So another thing I recommend with your friends, ask your friends. How would you describe my performance? How would you describe who I am? How, does, how would you describe my teachings? Okay? And ask them to just tell only the positive thing about your <laughs> okay? um, performance and teachings. Okay? In terms of bio, we don't really need to have a negativity in here. And list them. Okay? That's a good way to start to see like, who you are from objective perspective. Now, these bios will be always updated, okay? Every semester, you do something new, you perform, right? So you'll continuously update every semester. Now, I'm listening to helpful tips, do and don'ts, but let's jump right in and see some examples, now, shall we? I took this from my former students in New York, so it's, you know, five years old. But let's see, this person, New York City-based pianist Umbi Kim produces modern interdisciplinary concert experiences. Already here, she's not just a regular pianist, right? Interdisciplinary con concert experiences. <laughs> That's kind of interesting, right? It already gives you a hook. And also, New York City-based. Now, New York City is a brand, right? It gives you a kind of a branding aspect to it. So she's using that. That's a hollow effect. Yeah, New York City pianist. Okay, she's trying to make it a little bit impressive, which is useful. She thrives in collaborating with other art forms to present classical and contemporary music in unique settings. So this is how she wanted, okay, reader to understand her, her artistry and her interests. Then she goes into the most recent project, okay, what she did in recent years. Okay, so this is kind of trying to show um, the things she did and trying to impress the reader with the recent activities. Then she goes into the past, right? She previously produced these concerts, right? So that was her bio, very short. Notice she was student, but she didn't talk about her education here, okay? If she added that she's pursuing her bachelor's degree at Manhattan School of Music in New York, okay, it doesn't kill the vibe, but then the audience will know, oh, okay, she's a student. Kind of cool, but she's a student, right? She on purposely omitted her education so that the reader will look at her, okay, expect her to be a professional. This is the one technique, right? Now, she's a fr flutist. Sonora Salkum is a principal flute of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. So she wanted to everybody to know that she is a principal flutist. To win the position is a prestige, right? It's a big deal. So this is her way of kind of saying, hey, I'm great. Okay, I'm a principal flutist of Milwaukee Symphony. Now, then she quoted, okay, somebody said, 
Salkin's solo work continues to impress. She plays with clean, well-tuned sound, easily floating through the hall rather than slicing the air, always creating graceful phrases. Shepard Express. Now, yes, it's nice to have a quote. However, it's too long. The quote is too long and too detailed. Okay? And somehow it gives me the impression that this is not impressive. Okay, so she's over showing her you know, excellency here. So if you want to quote something, shorter is better, okay? And it really doesn't matter where it was described. You know, I don't even know Shepherd, what Shepherd Express is, okay? It really doesn't matter, okay? But we have to list it, okay? If you don't list it, it doesn't mean anything. It looks fake, okay? So make sure it could be Somebody said, you're an amazing young artist, famous artist, said that to you, or somebody wrote a recommendation letter and said something like that. Just put their name, okay? But that person has to be sort of well-known in the field, okay? Now then she goes into her experience. She has performed with orchestras throughout the United States and Asia. Now, notice United States and Asia. United States is a country. Asia is not a country. Right? She might have just performed in Japan. But just saying Asia, it gives you an impression that she has performed, you know, China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, all sorts of places, right? This is a gray area. Okay? You have to kind of decide how you how honest you want to be. <laughs> All right, because this is technically <laughs> a not, not a lie. Like Japan is a part of Asia, so you could say Asia, right? So this is a gray area, okay, that you have to kind of decide for yourself. And, you know, I could say I performed in Europe, but I only performed in two places, okay? But I could say that. Or I could say I performed in three different, three different continents, whereas I only visited three different countries. Okay, you become the judge of that. But hey, the bio is to impress, right? Impress the reader. So we want to sort of expand it a little bit, okay, to the edge. But of course, you shouldn't lie, right? Lying is not good in, the, in terms of bio. So this is interesting to have a kind of a gray area. Okay, and then she goes on to talk about her other collaborations and experiences. Now, look, let's see. Education. Now she goes on. She received her bachelor's of music degree from Cardiff and master's of music degree in orchestra performance from MSM. She attended Music Academy West and all these prestigious schools, and she's listing her famous teachers. Okay? Since she completed... Now, no longer we see her as a student, right? And she's completing a school with, you know, prestigious schools, so it could be impressive, right? So she's actually trying to really impress the reader with this bio, as you can see. Now, let's look at this violinist, a fierce advocate of contemporary music, Brooklyn-based violinist. Anne Lancelotti has distinguished herself bringing an expressive sound and fossil technique to the most compelling music today. Now, this is problematic because she, quote, said something about it and didn't show where it come from, right? This is a red flag, okay? When I see that, red flag, okay? However, the first sentence, a fierce advocate of contemporary music and Brooklyn-based that already gives you a kind of sense of idea, right? She's not going to dress up like a dress, right? She's going to be a little hippie, yeah, probably. And she likes to play contemporary, so she's not going to play Bach for you, okay? Already, this is like giving you a visualization of she, who she is going to be, right? And then she talks about her experience and listening to famous people, right? Now, it says, a passionate teaching artist, and she's a viola faculty at NYU. It's interesting that she didn't say a teacher. She said a 
teaching artist. You have to kind of think about that. Was that the actual name of the position, or was she decided to call herself a teaching artist? Okay. So you have to kind of decide, okay, how you wanna call yourself. But this is she wants to brand herself in this way. Now, let me show you a friend of mine. Recent year. Like, this is a recent copy of one of my friends from New York. I changed her name, by the way, so this is not her real name. And to show you how I changed her bio. So, Sarah Kim is a collaborative pianist and vocal coach equally committed to vocal and instrumental music. That's her first sentence, kicker. Kind of softer, like generic, like, okay, she's a companist, wants to play with singers and instrumentalists. All right. Many people do that. Now, Miss Kim is currently pursuing master's degree at the prestigious Manhattan School of Music. Although, now, right away, she's showing, oh, she's a student. And she's calling prestigious, okay? Never use the word prestigious. Prestigious award, prestigious competition. Because if it's prestigious, people will know. You don't need to tell them, right? So the word like this, what we call it, uh, cliche words, will degrade your bio. Yeah, so you really want to avoid it, okay? Be careful with that. Then she goes on to, recently she was assistant conductor and all these projects, okay, that she did. Then she goes back to her <laughs> degree again. She has completed a professional study certificate and got the bachelor's degree, okay? So she showed the audience twice that she's a student. She currently works as a staff pianist, okay? She's working in these institutions. And then she talks about another experience that she did. It's more recent experiences. So it goes back and forth, but can you see her focus? And she's thinking herself as a student, right? She's not confident, like, or she's scared to show herself as a professional. Now, I worked with her, and she's an amazing pianist. And she's super busy because she plays really well, but she's a little timid, right? So. I changed her bio into this. We sat down and thought about, okay, how, how should we brand her? And we came up with a collaborative pianist, okay? She's a collaborative pianist, not accompaniment. Collaborative pianist, Sarah Kim, is in high demand because she is really high demand, okay? Captivating audiences with her keen ensemble skills at the highest caliber. Sounds professional, isn't it? And it's really true. This is who she is, okay? Then show her recent experiences at the most impressive venues like Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, okay? Remember, we are not showing anything about her education yet, okay? Recently, she served as assistant conductor, okay? So she's, again, professional. And she's even conductor, not a pianist. Ooh. Then we're showing she's actually from Seoul, Korea. Huh, personal information. She immigrated to the United States at age 14 with her family. Interesting, very personal. Then she goes on to talk about her education, receiving numerous scholarships. She is pursuing a master's degree, okay, right now, and her teachers include these people. How does that change your perspective of who she is as a musician? using the same information, basically, right? So you see the power of bio, okay? And how it communicates to your career and who you are. Having said that, it's very difficult to write bio, okay? And you can't do it by yourself, okay? You need help with your friends and teachers, okay? And revise it, right? If you want to have any help with your bio, send me an email. I'm happy to look at it and give you uh, feedback, okay? I've done this hundreds of times, so I really enjoy doing this. Now, do you have any questions about bio so far? Burning questions. 
No questions? Okay. Now, how many of you, after going through these points, do you think you could revise your bio by yourself? Okay. And kind of. <laughs> okay. What are the biggest challenges for you how to write your own bio? What would be the biggest challenge? Anybody? Is it coming up with fancy introduction? Yes? Students. What do you mean by that? You because you're a student? Correct. Yeah, you're a student. Absolutely right. But your experience, okay, so far, okay, getting educated in professional music school is completely different from your, your other friends in other schools already. Yeah? You're already ahead. Okay? Now professional means pro means to be ahead. Yeah. And you already know so much about the music. You've done, you played, you work with professionals, right? Your teachers are professionals, okay? So really, it's a practice, okay? Start to think of yourself as a professional, because in the next few years, you'll be all professional. Once you're out of here, get a degree, you're professionals, okay? Sooner or later, that's coming. So why not start now, right? What's the difference? I know, it's mentally not easy, but I recommend it. All right. Let me move on to resume. Let me see. Okay, now resume is more useful in terms of applying for the job, okay? When you apply for teaching positions, okay, they're not gonna ask you for your bio, right? Bio is usually for performance. Resume is for your job, right? And you could be an amazing teacher, amazing performer, but if you have a horrible looking resume, you won't get a job, okay? Because the first stage is to be shortlisted, right? Let's say there are 50 applicants, you know, be the top five that they select you looking at the resume. Isn't it crazy? They're not going to look at your teaching, your performances, or who you are. They just look at this one piece of a paper and place you into the short list. Okay? So I really want you to know the significance of resume. It's not just listing your experience. Now, since many of you already have a resume, I'm going to skip what you need to be in there and, you know, dive into the points. But in order to write a great resume, you really need to think from employers, employers' perspective, okay, what they want, okay, and show them what they want, okay, within your experience. So if they ask you, okay, they want a teacher, and your resume start with performances, that's not a good impression, right? You want to make sure you show them that your teaching experience at the very first. Now, statistics says they only spend six seconds scanning the resume. That's a statistic. I would say two seconds. Really, these people who are looking at the resume, they don't have time. <laughs> really, they're tired, and they're not getting paid to do this. They hate to see your resume. That's the attitude I think you should have. So you have to make sure it's the easiest way to be able to catch the information and the cleanest. Okay, so that now we have two points, employee, employer's needs and then cleanness. Visual, visual is so important in terms of resume. Now there's a difference between resume and CV. CV is curriculum vitae. You could just say the longer version of CV. Usually for teaching positions, regular teaching positions like private studio or public schools, they ask you for a resume. But if you're applying for, let's say, higher education, it's going to be always CV. Now, CV, you have to include everything about what you did professionally. So it's, it's going to be 
long, long paper, like 10 to 20 pages easily. Okay, that's CV. But today we're going to focus on resume. Okay, but I recommend you to start building both of them because resume, okay, will be used for very specific jobs. Okay, that could be teaching position, that could be the administrative position, or that could be completely something else, right? But the CV is where you document everything. Like even the smallest thing, document it. You can put it into your CV because you'll forget, okay, within a year or two what you did. So if that means, you know, playing at the church, document it, okay, that you played at this church, okay? You taught a few students privately, document it, right? Every small detail of experiences are your experiences. So create CV, but out of CD, you select relevant information and create a resume each time you're applying for the job. Okay. Letterhead. Yeah, designing letterhead is kind of fun, but also stressful because that's where you could be personal. Okay, you could show your personality. But letterhead includes your name. Let me show you. Um, this is letterhead. Your name, your instrument of what your profession, your home address, phone number, email, website. All the inf important information should be on the letterhead. And this is something you should create. Okay? This is your brand. Right? So you could choose different kinds of font, right? size, style. Having said that, Okay, having said that, you still want to aim for the clarity. Okay? So don't go crazy. Don't write, include different colors and make it rainbow. Okay? <laughs> Black and white. Okay? But the font, okay, at least for your name and your instrument, you have a little more freedom. So that's letterhead. And you should use that for all professional materials that you're going to create, including Depends, sorry, that depends on the situation. But cover letter, sometimes yes. Bio, if you want to send out to a presenter, you're going to use your letterhead and write your bio. Okay? If you're writing a recommendation for your high school student, you're going to use this and write recommendation. So letterhead is your business brand. Now, what time is it? Okay. So things to include in The resume, okay? And since we are all musicians, we definitely need to include teaching experience, okay? I think that's the most important, okay? Because many of you want to be a teacher, right? So teaching experiences go first. That's the first thing you want to show. Then your performance experience, okay? Then your education. Then some hours, scholarships. Now, this person decided to put the education, okay, before hours. Now, rule of thumb, again, just like a bio, you want to put education at the very last, okay? Education is not important in terms of bio, okay? What they care is your experience. They don't really care, okay, where you studied. They want to see, okay, if you have a degree, fine, that's all we care. What's your experience? That's America. <laughs> It's, it's amazing, okay? That's not the case in Asia where I am from, okay? In the bio, in the resume, first thing they see is where did you study? <laughs> That's all they care. So it's very interesting. I think this is a great, great system in America and great kind of culture that you have. Okay, so experience matters. Now for this person, she includes something called professional profile that kind of summarizes your experience, we don't need that. Take that away, okay? Nobody wants to read it. Nobody wants to read the sentences because they don't have time, okay? So we'll just get rid of it, right? Now, let's go one by one. So in a teaching experience, you need to have your title, position, name of a school, and location. We need a location too state, okay? If it's in New York, New York. If it's in 
Fontana, MT, right? And the year, okay? These are the elements that we need. Position, name of institution, location, year, okay? Now, only for the teaching experience, though, you could detail it, what you did in there. How many students you taught, right? You taught solo or group lessons, or did you teach theory and oral skill, right? You want detail, okay? In the bullet points. Do you see the bullets? Now let's take a look at another person. Okay, this is much better. Now this person is a private teaching studio, okay? And the age is ranging from six to 30, okay? So we could kind of see, oh, this person's experience to teach a wider variety of age groups. Emphasis on Sarceto technique, theory, ear training, and musicality. And we all <laughs> focus on as a teacher, but why not list it? Okay, prepare students for solo performances and conservatory auditions. Okay, so you get a little bit about, you know, what this person teaches. Okay, so this is useful. But a little bit of super detailed technicality. For after reading hundreds of resumes, Okay, I came to a conclusion that I don't like bullet points. Why? Once you receive this, your eyes are fixated into bullets. It's actually pretty difficult to read through it, isn't it? Like your eyes get a little tired trying to find information. Okay? So I decided to avoid bullet points. And what I did, it was a like, tiny line that I want to show you. Um, let me show you in the next example, okay? So, but that's a small detail that we can talk about. Okay, teaching experience, performance experience, administrative experience, okay? if you worked in the office, okay? Or any kind of work experience could be relevant. And then education at the very bottom, all right? You see the same tendencies, right? Teaching experience, great. Selective performance experience. Uh, that's kind of, kind of fancy. Like you, you perform so many that it's a selected, okay? Hours, honors, okay, you're great students. Maybe you won competitions. And then education, okay? Pretty cool. Membership, okay? So sometimes you may be already in a, like a membership of certain associations, like, you know, Montana Teachers as Association. So that could be one of them. Any as, you know, membership, if you have one, list it because that will look good. Having said that, right, because it looked good on the resume, you want to think about becoming a member too. Okay? So by doing the resume okay, and by looking through the employees, employer's needs, you could kind of navigate your career. Okay, what do I need to add to make me look good on the piece of paper? Okay, so next year, maybe I'm going to teach in this school. I'm going to go out and do that. Or maybe I'm going to do this gig because that's going to help me to look better on the resume and advance my career, right? That's a good way to kind of navigate your personal project, okay, and opportunity that comes in. So as a rising artist, you have to, yes, do many things for free, right? It's part of our, you know, um, career to start off. But then you could choose, okay? You don't need to do everything, right? Who has time for that? You have to choose from the perspective, is it going to benefit my career? And the resume is a great place to start, yeah? I want to show you, again, an uh, example of one of my friends <laughs> who sent me her resume. I changed her name and address and all that. But this is her letterhead. <laughs> Pretty horrific because there's a line here, okay? And then information in the center, many different colors. Okay, already it's pretty confusing visually. And she started off, she's applying for the teaching position, start with professional experience. Okay. What does that mean? It's confusing already. And she lists all her experience as a pianist, lists name of famous teachers, right? 
Then finally, in other experience, she said this teaching experience. Yeah, is is it already red flag? It's very difficult to find the information, right? This is the most important information if you are applying for teaching positions. And it goes on to two pages. By definition, resume need to be one page. Okay, you have to make it within the one page. That's resume. Okay, more than that, it's not going to look good. So it's a process process of elimination too. You have to select the information that's most impressive and relevant. Now, uh, about the formatting, doesn't it look so difficult to read? Right? It's you have to kind of sit down and kind of find the information, okay? Vocal studio and these names and dots here, okay? Dates right here. If you scroll down, dates on the left back and forth, too many underlines, right? The color between the blue and black, it's hard to read because in the bolded black letter, you can see easier than the blue letters, right? So it doesn't give you a good impression, okay? If I receive this, I'm gonna be like, oh, oh no, okay? So using this information right here, I worked with her and created this version. This is one page. Okay, simplified the letterhead. Collaborative pianist, educator, okay. Information about her address and stuff. Then right away, teaching experience. Okay, that's the most important information. Show the teaching experience, okay. Probably we should include more detail Okay, about what kind of a teaching experience she has here. Okay, right under here. Like how many students, age group, her style. Okay, but I want to pay attention to the dates. Okay, when you see 2008 to 2010, I didn't write this way. 2010 and 2008 and 2010. We don't repeat the 20 because we don't need it. It's hard to read, too many numbers. So you get rid of that, okay? And I want to start using the same format, okay? If you start something and then still doing that, just say present, okay? And the dates should line, in, line up at the same place because it's easy for your eye to follow. Right, you could easily catch the information, the dates, yeah. Now, sometimes you don't want them to really see the dates. Okay, it happens sometimes, like that you took a gap year, right? Did some other experience, and you don't really want them to know that there's a, a year gap or two. We could make it ambiguous. Okay, you have to choose, but then if that's what you're gonna do. place it right next to other information, like that. Okay, and stay with it, with this format, okay? But I don't like it personally, because it's hard to see on the piece of paper, because there are too many blank space on the right, right? So, you wanna make sure to format in this way. Okay, that's my personal recommendation of that. And next, work experience, okay? Because we are applying for the teaching position, okay? And trying to impress the reader with famous places that she worked as a staff pianist, okay? And all the dates are here. Now, she had so many experience with working with famous people, so we list it, we create the list in three columns right here. Maybe it's too much, okay? I don't like it, but she insisted that she want to include everybody. But I recommend reducing, if you have so many lists of people that you work with, okay? Select top five, okay? Or top three, that's enough. And then at the last, education, right? Education will always go at the very last. Now, in terms of formatting though, Don't worry about having white space, okay? We want to have breathing space. That will come across 
as a confidence that you're a confident person. Okay? If you feel with all the information, and that will come across as desperate. Okay? So why space is our friend. Okay? And it's really the process of elimination in terms of writing resume. But you want to make sure to show the information that employer is looking for. Okay? That's the game. Now, I like to use the capital letter for each category to differentiate, right? And then create the line. It helps visually to catch the information quicker. You see the line, psst, it's easier for I get to it, to the information. So these lines could be helpful, right? So we have basically four big categories, right? So you could easily see teaching experience and work ex experience in a different category. And then the education. And also notice that all the left side is lined up. And when I actually have to show a little bit of detail, I indent it. This is called indentation. Okay, so creating the space and show the information. And remember, I didn't use the dots, right? I'm using the line. I prefer it. It looks cleaner, okay? And easier to actually catch the information. Okay? So you could use that. And all these formatting technique, it's in the word, okay? If you need help, I'm happy to show you how to do it. So send me an email, okay? So this is how you could create an amazing resume, okay? And she did get a job, by the way, after this. So it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, right? Yeah, from here, yeah, this might not, you know, have done well. Okay, so I have all these information at my hand, and I'm going to send you an email, okay, with this, and, you know, really start working on it. And if you have any questions, I'd love to help you. So just shoot me an email. I'm always here in the office, so we could make an appointment and go through it. Now, before we end, any last burning questions about anything? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> how do you tell somebody that you are very close that your resume sucks? <laughs> well, honesty is really good. Just go to the, to the person, hey, I really care about your future and I care about your, f <laughs> you know, I care about, you know, your success and I really, really think, you know, you need to update your resume. <laughs> Can I help you? Like, can we go? Can we do it together? I think that's also a good way to say it. Can we do it together? Uh, can you tell me what's wrong with my resume? But can I tell you what's wrong with your resume as well? That's also a good way to go. Hopefully, that's not your girlfriend. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes. So, because you're still in a bachelor's degree, I'm okay with you including high school ex experiences after high school. That's fine, okay? In the bio, okay? In the bio. Because if younger than that, okay, we want to kind of see what's, if you were like a child prodigy, let's say, you could start with that, but that's also not helpful because we are no longer a child. Okay, so I would say high school would be a good place to stop. Now, in terms of resume, though, no high school, just college. Okay, college is the starting point of your education, so don't include your high school. Okay. Yes. Absolutely yes. Like, there's no excuse. If you want people to find you, you need to create a platform for people to be able to find you, okay? So website, absolutely yes. Instagram, of course. TikTok, it's getting hot. <laughs> YouTube, no reason to. 
Like, you need to do that. Otherwise, people can't find you, okay? So, like, really, you have a great product, right? Who you are as a musician, as a teacher, <laughs> share it with the world. And it doesn't have to be great or perfect, okay? People also want to see the process of you becoming a great musician or a teacher. Why not share the process as well, okay? And that will give you a chance to have a fan, okay? It doesn't have to be like a million viewers, right? Because for your purpose, it, it's going to be your students, it's going to be your parents, okay? So you want to create a platform so that people can't find you, okay? So absolutely no excuse. Do it. It doesn't cost any money. Creating a website is easy these days, okay? Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. And please keep in touch and send me all your stuff. Thank you.